In this video, I'm going to talk a little on tunnel systems. Now, the primary example I am using on this are tunnels that were dug by the Vietnamese starting in the 1940s up through the mid 1970s. These tunnels were used against the French and then later the South Vietnamese and then after 1965 or so they uh, expanded their construction considerably and used them against the Americans until the fall of Saigon. Now this last week on Patreon I posted some videos on tunneling. There was a uh, general documentary on uh, tunnels in Vietnam. You can do searches on YouTube for that and it'll pull up multiple different uh, documentaries and TV shows that have been done on the Viet Cong tunnels. Watch one or two of them, you'll probably pick up a few tips. Uh, there was also a video that I linked to that was taken by a veteran who went on a tour of the Coochie tunnel system. Once again, there's multiple videos on that. Also, watch that so that you can see some tips from that also. But uh, I will put in the description for this video links to some videos that are done by a person that uh, posts videos on mining for gold here in the United States, in the southwest United States. He had a few videos on how to put in the supports for his tunnels, uh, for his mines how to uh, dig the uh, entrance tunnels, the entrance shafts, how to uh, put in the supports so that they would not collapse, how to support the branches, the tunnels coming off the shaft, and that. So those would be uh, good references to look at. Uh, I will also post in there a uh, link to a video from World War II by the British government called uh, debris tunneling. It was done by the uh, emergency services in England for uh, during the Blitz where they would tunnel into collapsed buildings to get at survivors. Uh, there's a few tips that they give in there that can be used with those mining videos to give you an idea on how to expand your tunnels and that stuff without them collapsing on top of you. So those will give you a good starting point. I will say that uh, size of the tunnels I think will be dictated as to what level they are. Uh, the first one or two levels, which are the ones most likely to be found, I would keep them smaller, say uh, four foot by four foot, or potentially three foot by uh, four foot, just big enough for you to get through there with your gear on or pulling uh, ammo crates and stuff behind you through the tunnels to get them to the storage rooms where they need to go or for pulling through litters with casualties to get them to infirmaries a little bit easier so that they can be operated on. Now I have some uh, pictures here. You can do a general search on uh, Google or whatever search engine you want. Uh, look for uh, VC tunnel systems, images, diagrams, pictures, and that type of stuff, and you'll pull up lots of uh, pictures like these. You're not going to be able to read on this video the little info they got on the pictures, but there's a few things on these pictures I wanted to point out. And that's why I uh, printed those particular ones. So, let's see if we can get adjusted to one of the pictures. Now, in that particular picture, we have the uh, tunnel system is located underneath a village. Now, Obviously you could have 
entrances into the t into the uh, tunnels concealed in the floor of the structure or if there is a basement in the wall of the structure depending on how you want to do it uh, which you can't really tell right here in this part of the picture is an animal pen in Vietnam apparently the Viet Cong they found that they could hide tunnel entrances inside animal pens very easily because the GIs did not want to go in there and deal with all the uh, pig feces and that stuff trying to find tunnel entrances so they would hide them in the bottoms of the uh, animal pens and if Americans were on the way they would uh, local villagers would toss on a few uh, fresh uh, steaming liquidy piles right over the entrance and they knew the Americans would not look for them. Over here we have a spider hole. I did a video on those. Well one thing we had in here at the base of the hole was an entrance into the tunnel system so after he popped up he fired at uh, the GIs coming in on a patrol, pop back down, maybe drop the cover back over his head, crouch down, move to the side, drop down, lift up the lid for the tunnel, drop down in the tunnel and he would disappear. Americans would come in, possibly toss a grenade in into the uh, spider hole. No one's air grenade would go off. And then obviously your entrance is concealed inside vegetation like underneath bushes and stuff like that inside uh, giant uh, grass clusters and that stuff you're really tall grasses if that's the case probably have an entrance so that you have like uh, six to eight inches of earth on top of it so creating essentially a box plant some of that grass in there make sure it's growing good to help conceal your entrance Now another thing you can look inside here, something that was mentioned in, by the tour guide on the, tu on the uh, Coochie tunnel systems. The tunnels were not set up one on top of the other, like a uh, hotel or high rise building he said. What the Viet Cong found out, or as he called them liberation soldiers would fi find out, when that was done, when the bombing raids would come through, the B-52 strikes, the F-4 Phantoms, or even artillery strikes, if they were one right on top of the other, like a building, the force of the blast would actually cause them to pancake, to collapse. So what they would do, they would have first level in one area, then tunnel down, then you'd have your second level, tunnel down over you'd have your third level or and then fourth level and so forth essentially uh, I would recommend think of uh, for numbering your levels think of the way the Europeans do a lot of their high-rise buildings and stuff something that was common in Germany you had your ground floor your Grundstück and then the first floor was right above that and what in America would be the second floor so for here in the US you could have your first level which is you know pretty much at ground level right below and that would have your fighting positions and that stuff your bunkers and so forth and then your first floor your first level would actually be below that and I really would recommend a minimum of 10 foot of earth over the top of your first level. That will uh, give you better cushion during airstrikes and also artillery bombardments. Mortars you, they aren't going to affect you that much, but it's the heavier ordnance you got to think about preparing against and protecting against 155 millimeter artillery, protecting, protecting against 500 pound drop bombs, your more common ordnance that you would expect during airstrikes and artillery strikes. Yes, I know they could drop a bunker buster on you, they could drop a Moab and all that stuff and it doesn't matter how deep you go. But guess what, there's only so many of those in the inventory and they're not going to be dropping those all over the country on every single tunnel system they come across. They're going to use the most common ordnance they have available to them against those tunnel systems. 
So figure at least 10 feet of earth over the top of your first level and then I would think of probably doing another 10 feet of earth from the bottom of that first level to the roof of your second level or second tier. Remember to reinforce your roofs very heavily especially in that first level because that's the one that's going to receive most of the concussive force from the blast going off above it. Farther down the force is going to dissipate so then you'll probably be fine with your uh, 8 inch, 10 inch or whatever size logs or 6 inch whatever is appropriate for the type of soils you have in your area with the waterproof covers and all that type of stuff. Uh, here in the United States we have a lot of rain, not as much rain as in Vietnam, but we still get quite a bit. So plan for putting that uh, waterproof barrier up above the roof and make sure that it drapes over the sides to uh, push the water away from the people and the materials that are stored inside. Now this picture here shows a lot of uh, different ways that the tunnels would be uh, protected such as uh, booby traps, mines inside the tunnels, uh, people hiding right on the other side of doorways when the GIs would put their uh, head through the narrow entrance to have a look because they couldn't get in, in there very well. That person would plunge a knife in their back wrap a wire around their throat and strangle them, whatever it turned out to be. Now let's get you over to the next picture. That one shows better on the distribution of the levels. <clears throat> and uh, this is one that would be encountered more in the jungles inside the uh, rubber plantations and that type of stuff away from the villages. And in this particular one they had rooms that essentially were dug right in the soil and then they put in the roof at ground level going up so they would mound it a bit. Personally, I think that would give it away, but you know, if you camouflage it right, you could probably get away with it. Make sure to uh, that your vegetation that is planted over the top looks perfect, that it blends in naturally. But doing a type of raised roofs like that, that would allow you to use uh, four bunkers. Uh, in the Coochie video, I will point this out, they uh, did have some pictures in, during the tour of uh, what looked like termite mounds but were actually bunker roofs. You really couldn't see it but down at the ground level or a little bit above it was the bunker slit and it was just wide enough for someone to put the barrel through for their rifle or the machine gun, look down those sights and then squeeze off the rounds at the approaching allied troops. The roof of that bunker, of that fighting position, was camouflaged to look to blend in naturally with the area to look like a natural termite mound. Uh, those termite mounds they would also use for ventilation into their shelters and also for dissipation of smoke from their kitchens inside the tunnel systems. Over here, there's something that's marked as a Dien Bien Phu kitchen. So down here we have our little stove that's built into the wall. We have our stove pipe that goes into a chamber, then another pipe that another little tunnel that goes off of that to another chamber, then out to another tunnel and then off of that tunnel roof you have smaller shafts that would go to those termite mounds or up through trees hollowed out trees and stuff if you want to think of the uh, Forest Brothers bunkers and it would dissipate the smoke over a wider area. The Viet Cong typically would do the cooking for the day early in the morning as the fog and the mist is covering the ground so the smoke coming out of the ground would blend in with it 
and the uh, GIs would not pick up that hay it smoke. They would maybe smell it, but because it's coming out of multiple locations, they couldn't narrow down where it was at. Now, the ventilation shafts, something that was mentioned for the uh, termite mounds that were used as ventilation shafts. Because the, the uh, U.S. troops would bring in uh, German shepherds and other dogs to try to find you know, enemy personnel, they would use American scents around the openings for those ventilation shafts. So what they would do, if they could get a hold of it, they would use a dirty piece of American clothing that would have the scent of an American on it, shove some of that up inside the entrance to that ventilation shaft so the dog would smell that and ignore it. Another thing they would use would be pepper black pepper, cayenne pepper, whatever they had available to uh, get the dog to lose his sense of smell for the rest of the day. Uh, they would also use uh, slivers of soap, American soap. That also would uh, give a good camouflage to any scent or anything coming up from that ventilation shaft. Always remember when you do tunnels, make sure that you cover ventilation. Don't forget it. It's extremely important. Uh, there is a battle from the Civil War called the uh, Battle of the Crater. I know there is a good documentary on that that talks about how miners in the engineer regiment dug the tunnel to uh, put the uh, gunpowder in that they blew to create the crater and they talked about in there for ventilation they built a uh, ventilation uh, box essentially along one corner of the uh, floor for the tunnel and then every so many feet they had small fires well those small fires would heat the air the hot air would rise and leave through shafts going up through the roof but as it's doing that, it would pull fresh air, cool air, from the outside down that uh, wooden ventilation uh, shaft or ventilation tube into the uh, mine. And they had it every so many feet. They figured out this is how far they needed to do it to keep that air constantly flowing through there naturally without, obviously, before the... Uh, requirements for mechanical means they were still having to uh, get ventilation into mines and into shafts and stuff that's one way they came up with that's something to think about uh, something you see on this one here hiding an entrance to your tunnel inside a well there aren't too many uh, bucket wells across the United States anymore at least for now uh, during the war, as things would get bad, people still need water. They'll probably see a resurgence of some of these old-style wells. Well, you can do entrances into the tunnel system off on the sides of those wells. Conceal them in there. And that brings us into the next picture down here. Water entrances. This is, this is pretty ingenious. Now, one of the ways the U.S. troops would try to clear out tunnel systems, first, they would toss in a smoke grenade and they would watch where the smoke came out of the ground that told you where the entrances were. They would then post guys wherever the smoke was coming out of the ground. After they did that, they would toss in CS grenades or they would pump it in there with uh, air pumps that was effective. Well, how do you counter that? Well, one of the ways they did it, the VC did it, you had your tunnel, they dug down, dug over, dug back up, and then in here, they filled with water. Now, I should mention, in Vietnam, there's a lot of clay in their soil. You don't see too much uh, reinforcing of the walls and the ceilings in uh, VC tunnels. The reason for that is the high clay content. What they would do, they would dig their tunnel, it'd be nice and fresh, and then in a few days or a week, whatever it was, that clay would dry 
essentially turning the sides into a giant clay pot. So that would allow for the retention of water down in these little sumps here or water lock as they call it. So the Americans find a tunnel entrance over here, toss in CS, the CS comes in, it's not going to go through the water. So you have your little water lock here that's going to stop that CS from going into the rest of the tunnel. Down here, a very common one, you had a river or something or a stream nearby village or whatever. You can probably have a particular area where there was a lot of cattails, bushes, and that type of stuff, and that was your little marker for that unit that, hey, we have an entrance hidden there. Go into the water, dug down underneath the surface of the water was, a ton was the entrance into the tunnel system. So they drop down into the water, go down how many feet, a couple feet, two or three, and then find that entrance, pop up inside, exit out of the water and then they're fairly dry or or that as they're moving through the tunnel system and it's concealed uh, on this one it also shows a uh, hut hidden underneath the hut is an entrance into the tunnel system that entrance is completely covered by the little cooking area inside the hut by their giant pot or whatever they have set up if uh, Mama San has the uh, fire cooking away in that stuff, the GIs are not going to be as likely to move that flat fire out of the way to check underneath for tunnels. So the GIs are coming in. She gets that fire going right over the top of the entrance, puts the pot over the top. You've camouflaged it. It also shows on here running some of those air vents up into bushes. And that shows it over here also. Now we'll move over some considerations for shaping your tunnels, your cross sections. This is the strongest, the arched roof. All the weight and that stuff comes down on the top. If you have this arched correctly, you have the right uh, diameter and that stuff, the load will be spread out and it will not crush it. That's why you see a lot of arched roofs or barreled roofs in uh, ancient uh, structures. They figured out that that's an extremely strong structure when done correctly. Your soils and all that stuff and the materials you have have to work uh, meld together pretty good for that one. This takes a lot more work to get this just right and it's going to take a lot more materials that have to be placed just right to keep that arch in the roof. Next for strength after that is going to be your peaked, your triangular shape. Obviously you're going to have more room down on the floor that you'd be able to move through. Up at the top you're not going to be able to move that much but maybe you could use that, close the very top of it off a little bit, use that as your ventilation shaft. That's something to think about that would be easier to do. Uh, apparently the VC did this in uh, air raid and bomb shelters inside their tunnel systems inside that first level that would receive the most of the force. They figured out by doing a triangular shaped rooms like this or triangular shaped vaults the blast that would happen above wouldn't crush them as easily. Now the weakest type of tunnel you can do is squared. Just your box going through the ground. It's not going to take much to crush it, to break through in the center here somewhere and then all that soil, all that rock, all that material is going to fall on top of you. This is obviously the easiest to construct. Now in the mining videos, what he showed for timbering on uh, his uh, mines you have a flat roof the sides though are angled and the offset from 90 degrees in was one to two inches for every foot so if you're going four foot and that's from 
the top of this little uh, base plate here at the bottom of your column. From here to just under the top of your header, if that's four feet, this is going to be offset. This corner here is going to be offset from this corner by four to eight inches from the 90 degree. And then one thing he recommended, make sure to get in there, especially up at the top, is braces. So you got your uh, posts here on the side. Well then, and then behind that would be your lagging, as he called it, the boards that hold the walls in. Put in some braces, a brace piece across the top here, 2x6 or 2x4, depending on the type of wood you're using up here. Put that in there so that these posts do not fall in on themselves. Something you could think about too, putting in a brace across the bottom here, right over the top of your, floor pl your uh, base plate here. And then using that brace as a support to put in flooring. Putting in some uh, boards for across the floor to get you up off the soil. And that would help with your drainage. If you add that in there, think of uh, possibly putting in some drainage tunneling here on the side or something. Little gutters and stuff that you put in there. So that any water that comes down, comes down the side of the wall and that stuff. It gets to the floor, it's going to start coming in across the floor. Well, you got your duck boards, your boards across the bottom here as flooring, and then underneath that, you got your gutters that'll help take the water away. And if you do that, make sure you got sumps located every so often, every so many feet, say uh, barrels type shapes dug into the soil off on the side that that water can flow into and then dissipate away. Now another thing that, that would come in handy if you had those floorboards in there, maybe have entrances to the next level, level hidden inside that tunnel somewhere. Maybe have a little mark that you have for on the post that's not as noticeable but someone moving through the tunnel would see it and know that hey in this section there's an entrance to the level below and then they know that hey you move like the three boards in the center whatever you have for your flooring here move those to the side or you lift them up and then there's an entrance to the next level right below it you you uh, start climbing down inside and then you lower that over the top of you as your enemy tunnel rats are coming through they may not find that entrance and because these boards are all bouncing on these little supports at the uh, ends of each section they're not going to notice as easily that hey the boards are bouncing because there's a tunnel underneath it they're going to be doing that anyway because you got that separation that's a way to uh, camouflage a little bit better any way you can come up with for concealing stuff inside your tunnel systems the better and always uh, do the best job you can with supporting it. Now something that is done with different militias across the United States, ones that have been around for a long time, that have been working on this for a while, that already have tunnel systems. They say that in every room that they have underground in their tunnel systems, in their bunkers and that stuff, they include hand tools for moving soil. So they put in their picks, they put in their pry bars, they put in their shovels. Now make sure that the shovels and that stuff that you have in there are ones that are easy for you to use inside that space. You don't want to put a long handled shovel in there and then the space that it's located in is a really small space that's not going to allow you to employ that shovel. So the longest you probably should have in there are your D-handle shovels, your little short shovels and then probably put in there some entrenching tools ones that can be folded either your single fold or your trifold so that way you can turn the at that blade on the handle and use that to scrape out some soil from the side to dig your way out so 
things to think about. Uh, be very careful with the size of your rooms. Always make sure you have more than enough supports than are required for inside your rooms. And the reason for that is bombardments. You want to support that roof when that artillery comes in or that airstrike comes in because that's going to be adding a lot of extra load to the, uh, the ceiling of your compartment of your room and you don't want it to crush down on top of you. Now I know ideally using concrete, using brick, using concrete blocks, I-beams and that stuff would be the number one choice. Most people are not going to have access to that. If you're building your tunnel systems now, you probably can. But during war, you're going to be using wood. You're going to be using whatever you can get a hold of. Maybe you're getting a hold of some sheet metal siding from buildings. Maybe some corrugated steel from old uh, machine sheds that have been uh, taken out. You're getting barn, barn beams. You're getting logs that you're cutting and peeling and trying to cure to use as your supports. You might be using for your drainage some uh, drainage pipe from a home that has been destroyed. You're taking the pipe and then uh, taking the drains and using that to help uh, take the water away inside your tunnels off to your little sumps. So. Uh, use plastic make sure to include that in there especially if you're in an area where it rains a lot if you're in the American Southwest you probably don't have to worry as much about that but most of the United States you're gonna have to deal with a lot of water from the rainy seasons and that stuff uh, also take into account if you're in the northern part of the United States what is the frost level for during winter how deep does the frost go and take that into account for where you locate your first level. You probably want your first level, your first tier, below that, fr that freeze point, below that frost level on the ground. Otherwise, it's going to be getting a little bit nippy in there. Uh, always take into account you need to have moving air for ventilation. Uh, inside tunnels, inside rooms underground, it's going to get hot. You have people in there, they produce body heat, they're breathing, so they're putting moisture in the air. It's going to get hot, it's going to get moist, it's going to get sticky, it's going to get uncomfortable. The best way around that is fans and moving air. Think about that, plan for it, include it in your designs. Now I know it's not all inclusive, all the information you could uh, ever hope for on tunnel systems, but it's probably more info than what you had before. It gives you some things to think about, maybe some tips. Uh, watch those videos that I'm going to put the links to inside the description. And if you have links to other videos that could help people out on doing this stuff, post it in the comments. If you have links to books or pamphlets that were distributed to assist miners with shoring up their mines, maybe some type of uh, pamphlet or booklet that was put out by emergency services on debris tunneling and that type of stuff, how to uh, shore them up and that type of stuff, try to put the links to those inside the descriptions or inside the comments. I will check the links before I allow it to uh, post in this video. If anyone puts a link in a comment, it automatically gets flagged and sent to me for approval. So that's how I know. And I will go through, I will check that link somehow. And I will make sure that I am in a, uh, it's a, a secure viewing at the time on how I uh, open up that link and stuff to make sure that it does go to a good location and does not uh, take you into a uh, virus laden hellhole. So now for all my engineer brothers and the Patriot Militia movements always remember essay ounce.